Welcome to Regulatory and Scientific Considerations for API Drug Development, presented by Pharmaceutical Outsourcing and sponsored by Cardinal Health. My name is Mike Auerbach, Editor-in-Chief of Pharmaceutical Outsourcing, and I will be the moderator. Before we begin, I'd like to inform our viewers that this event will hold a live question and answer session at the end of the presentations. You can submit a question at any time using the Q&A box on your screen. Also, please note the resource box containing documents pertaining to this webinar. So, allow me to introduce today's presenters. Uh, Michael Day is Director and Managing Consultant of Scientific Consulting for Cardinal Health Regulatory Sciences. Mr. Day holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from Rockhurst University and was an interdisciplinary PhD fellow in pharmaceutical science and organic chemistry at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. After joining Cardinal Health Regulatory Sciences in 2003, Mr. Day has been involved in consulting associated with drug substance and drug product development. as well as regulatory affairs. He has directed the preparation of regulatory submissions including drug master files, investigational new drug applications, new drug applications, and abbreviated new drug applications. In his current position at Cardinal Health Regulatory Sciences, Mr. Day is responsible for managerial, business, and technical aspects of a chemistry, manufacturing, and controls group. Our other presenter is Brian Cudney. Brian is Director and Executive Consultant for Cardinal Health Regulatory Sciences. Mr. Cudney provides strategic development and regulatory consulting services to a variety of drug and biological product manufacturers. He has more than 15 years of experience in regulatory affairs, drug development, and analytical development, which has been gained from past positions with Bayer, Achillion, and KV Pharmaceuticals. Mr. Cudney has experience with developing API manufacturing processes and formulation development of traditional immediate release and controlled release dosage forms, as well as many other novel dosage forms. He is also experienced with analytical method development and, and validation, and is a certified Six Sigma black belt. Mr. Cudney holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from Ball State University and an MBA from the University of Connecticut. Please welcome Mr. Day and Mr. Cudney. All right, thank you for that uh, uh, overview and, and introduction. Um, and uh, welcome to the webinar. If you're joining us live today, it's, it's tax day 2015. So if this is a work-related expense, don't forget that uh, it's a deduction on next year's taxes. If you're joining in a rebroadcast and you haven't filed your taxes, you're either too late or hopefully you're filing a, an extension. So let's start out with our objectives now. Our, our main objective is to walk you through the process from discovery of a molecular entity that may have some efficacy for human disease towards the approval of that new drug. And specifically, we're going to focus on the active pharmaceutical ingredient or the drug substance portion of this development process. We will look at the API requirements for marketing applications, specifically for um, the U.S. primarily. We will look at consideration for use of a drug master file for your active pharmaceutical ingredient, considerations for manufacturing of your active pharmaceutical ingredient at a contract manufacturing organization, some considerations for your active pharmaceutical ingredient from uh, that's manufactured from biologic sources, an overview of post-approval requirements after your drug has been approved by the FDA, and a recap of some of these major points and then followed by a, about a 15-minute question and answer session. Before we get started, we have a, a, a slide that shows some of the, the common abbreviations that will be used throughout the presentation. I won't go through each one of these individually, um, but you'll be able to refer back to these if you've downloaded the presentation. Um, the primary abbreviation will be API Active Pharmaceutical Ingredient, and I will use that interchangeably sometimes with the term drug substance. So for the purpose of this talk, 
um, those will be one and the same. The active pharmaceutical ingredient um, for our purposes today is the central ingredient in a drug product that causes a direct effect on a disease or diagnosis or the prevention, treatment, or cure of a disease. Next, we would like to take a look at some of the major components of an active pharmaceutical development program. And before we dive into that, we want to take a look at an overview of the drug development process itself. The slide in front of you shows an outline of the drug development process from discovery all the way through approval. We're going to primarily focus on some of the early preclinical research with your active pharmaceutical ingredient and get you through the various phases of drug development, phase one, two, and three, um, prior to getting a drug approved through a new drug application. In order to move your API through the steps in order to receive approval, we need to have a solid API development plan. And this plan needs to come into fruition early on in the process. And, and we're going to be talking about the various steps involved to ensuring that you have an adequate supply of your API throughout your drug development process. So this API development plan consists of selecting your resources, which includes some of these suppliers, which may be a contract manufacturing organization, as we've previously mentioned. We'll talk about the drug substance development itself, optimization of its synthesis, and understanding of some of the impurities that are inherent in API synthesis and how we need to handle them. And some of the key technical aspects of I, uh, understanding of our molecule of our drug substance that we need to have in order to prepare a, a submission that will be acceptable from a regulatory perspective. So we'll need to understand the structure and characterization of our compound, its physiochemical properties. We'll need to understand all of the aspects of its manufacturing process. And then, as we said before, truly understand the impurities or related substances and be able to track those from development throughout um, drug approval. The question that we get asked the most with regards to API development is typically what's the most critical aspect of API development? The most critical aspect is pretty straightforward but it is indeed to have enough API, to have enough drug substance in order to provide supplies for your clinical studies. If you don't have your API, you don't have clinical trial material, so you can't have your clinical studies. Um, as a drug is being developed, you'll need to have a, a resource of this API for, for many different aspects of the development, including the the non-clinical studies, the animal studies, where you're studying the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of the drug in animals. Um, in the clinical studies, once you finally receive approval to pursue an IND and pursue a phase one study, we need to make sure we have an adequate supply of this API in order to provide enough for those clinical supplies. So all of that needs to be thought out ahead of time and carefully choreographed with the, the clinical colleagues and some of the non-clinical colleagues that you as a potential CMC representative to this project would be working on. In some cases, areas come up where additional API is needed, such as if there's an extension to a clinical study, such as an extra arm added to that clinical study, or in many cases, a new toxicology study needs to be implemented. As we mentioned before, important that we're tracking our impurities throughout this API development, and if a manufacturing process is optimized or a synthesis is optimized or changed and a different new impurity occurs, we may need to do additional toxicology studies to, to bridge 
the earlier studies that we did before to the current status of our API and its current impurity profile. Some considerations when you're choosing a contract manufacturing organization to assist you in your API synthesis and development. Um, most CMOs that we've worked with provide excellent resource and expertise and we truly want to go to the contract manufacturing organizations that have some expertise in walking us through the development process, not just from a scientific and technical aspect, but from a regulatory aspect, understanding the different requirements for the manufacturing of the drug so that by the time we're submitting an application to perform investigational drug studies, that the drug has been manufactured in a proper manner. So as the sponsor of this study, you will want to visit and audit them. Now, typically, we don't do a on-site visit for a phase one drug, but we should familiarize ourselves with the contract manufacturing organization, look at some of their history with regards to interaction with the FDA, and see if there's any other shared information um, that is available with regards to previous work they have done with other sponsors for other um, API development projects. One of the things that we would typically put in place when we start to work with the contract manufacturer is something called a quality agreement. And a quality agreement um, doesn't have a set definition, but it's a, a document that provides kind of the deliverables that a contract manufacturing organization will provide when they will provide the, the actual API itself, um, the quality of API they, that they will provide, and the amount of API that they will provide. So it's good to have a quality agreement in place um, as you move forward in working with any contract manufacturing organization. But the bottom line to all of this and the key, and it sort of goes without saying, is communication. And as you work with this contract manufacturing organization, you will need to have constant communication with them. We typically set up weekly teleconferences as we move through um, the development process and getting a drug from development to a phase in which it's made by good manufacturing practices so it can be used in the first human trials. And that there is a, a good amount of time spent just communicating all of the nuances and details involved in this process. Now I'd like to take you through the developmental steps to get us from discovery of our drug to a new approved drug uh, approved by FDA. And so there are different phases of drug development. And for some of you, this is review. And for some of you, um, this is uh, maybe the first time you're hearing of these different phases of development. So the first phase of development for our active pharmaceutical ingredient is called phase zero. Phase zero is before the drug is being put into to any humans. So this involves the drug discovery portion of your research and development where you're searching for this lead molecular entity. So there may be different synthesis taking place at a lab scale to optimize some of the physiochemical characteristics of your active drug substance in order to make it uh, most efficacious or, or most amenable to the target in the body that you're searching to act upon. Also during phase zero, we have non-clinical drug development. Um, this is the, for, for the purposes of API, we're going to be now manufacturing our drug substance in order to supply the animal toxicology studies. For the animal toxicology studies, we don't require full GMP material, and by that I mean um, a, a certain level of documentation of the entire synthesis and manufacturing process um, in order to prove that it's a quality drug. For the tox studies, we typically call the, the API material GLP material, or Good Laboratory Practice Acceptable Material. It's still um, manufactured according to written instructions and, and preferably in controlled laboratory notebooks. 
that we're not talking about full-blown batch records and some of the other systems that will be in place for the manufacture of a GMP API, if you will. So for the purposes of the phase zero API supplies, we're providing our drug in order to assess the safety in animals and, and determine the toxicity of our drug in order to set some sort of a recommended dose for our phase one protocol when we start to go into humans. As we begin this development, and even as early as phase zero of your drug development, we want to be considering um, the end game, considering the new drug application. And one of the um, activities that we would pursue at this time is thinking of setting up a pre-IND meeting with the FDA. Um, the FDA can give valuable feedback, you know, during this phase zero portion of your drug development process, and it's important to take advantage of these interactions because the, the, the feedback that you get at this time will be uh, very key in the pathway in which you have to use in order to develop your drug to, to make it an approvable entity. There are a few different guidance documents that we reference in this slide with regards to the procedures for asking for a formal meeting with the FDA prior to submitting an investigational drug application, which you would then get approval for in order to do human studies. So some of the things that you would consider discussing with the FDA at this time include the physical properties of your drug, there may be different polymorphs of your drug, and the FDA may be very interested in how you control that polymorph. And you may want to get some thoughts on, on um, the amount of control they would like you to have. Um, control of stereochemical purity. As many of you know, in many cases, only one stereoisomer of a drug or of a compound is actually the active isomer. And in many cases, the FDA is going to ask how we control which stereoisomer is available, or if it really doesn't make a difference if it's a, a racemic mixture of drug. API starting materials are also a hot topic with the FDA, because as you can imagine, um, the beginning of a synthesis can be a fairly involved process, and the FDA is, want to, is going to want to get some assurance that we have quality control over the starting ingredients and the starting materials for our API synthesis. And so there's typically a little bit of a back and forth discussion over how far back in the synthetic process we need to have control over our starting materials and what would be the designated, if you will, GMP starting materials, the materials that need to have all of the documentation involved from a uh, ICHQ7A, good manufacturing practice perspective. And finally, and most importantly, always keep in the back of your mind that there's always going to be changes with regards to your drug development process, and the FDA fully expects that. Where you start at phase zero and where you end up in approval um, may be two completely different things, different synthetic routes, and, and part of the drug development process is, is, is building a, a system that has flexibility in it. But it's important to communicate these changes to the FDA um, so that we're not caught by any surprises at the end. Next is our phase one API development. So now we have, uh, we are developing API that is going to be put into humans. And so there are certain uh, additional details that are involved in, in the manufacture of this phase one API. So these are first in human studies and they're typically safety studies. For the most part, a phase one study is done in healthy volunteers um, in order to 
uh, study the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion now in humans as opposed to the animal models that we were using before. There's a few guidances and one that we reference here in this slide with regards to the content and format of a new drug an investigational new drug application for a phase one study. So compared to what we were doing for phase zero, we were probably now scaling up our synthetic route for the API manufacturer. And we're actually prepare, preparing what we call clinical trial material. And this involves now good manufacturing practices, as we've mentioned before, for these investigational drugs. So as opposed to being simply written instructions and in controlled laboratory notebooks, the FDA typically prefers, and what we typically see, are approved batch records for the manufacture of our active pharmaceutical ingredients. Along with that comes additional um, safety measures, including cleaning verification of the equipment itself. If you're using equipment that's been used for other syntheses, for other types of drug manufacture, there needs to be a cleaning verification in place in order to prove that there's no carryover of, of another API, of other impurities, or any other potential contaminants for your API. As we continue in phase one and we continue the development activities, we're going to do some initial process development. And in that process development, as we mentioned, we're going to begin to scale up our manufacturing process. So this is where you will start your QBD quality by design activities. At this point, you should have enough information to put down a good quality target product profile uh, at, at least in a draft form, and begin to assess your risk to, of your process, of your uh, molecule, to being able to achieve that quality target profile. You should also be able to look and begin to put a design space down for your process to determine what variables and how you want to adjust the variables to best optimize your process. We'll continue to um, assess the physiochemical properties of our active pharmaceutical ingredient, potentially do a little bit more structure elucidation, additional analytical identification studies um, to fully characterize our active pharmaceutical ingredient. At phase one, we will be doing initial audits of our suppliers and the, and the contract facilities that we'll be working with. And we'll begin to importantly, develop our analytical methods that we'll be using to analyze our drug substance. The analytical methods process is an evaluation of the drug from a stability indicating viewpoint. We want to understand how our drug is going to behave over time, if it's going to degrade, if there's going to be impurities. So we need to begin to develop methods in order to assess that. And typically, the, the main method used involves um, HPLC um, methodologies. Um, an HPLC methodology will allow us to look at our drug and its potential impurities and come up with an impurity profile. And this is pretty critical at this phase of development. We don't necessarily need to identify by full characterization, all of the impurities that are present in our API, but we do need to begin to track them. And one way that you can track them is on an HPLC, their relative retention time to the, the drug substance of interest. And so we want to start to draw some, some parallels to, to ensure that the impurities that we see or the related substances that we see as we manufacture our drug substance are consistent, that it's not a different set of impurities that happen after each, each synthesis or each manufacturing run. And so we start to track these things at this time, and that's very critical. Um, 
one of the reasons why this is critical is that, um, as we mentioned before, there's some toxicology studies, some animal studies that will be performed fairly early on in our process. And although that's not GMP material, we want to be able to draw a parallel to the studies that we're doing in humans to the earlier studies that were done in animals. If there's a completely different impurity profile, we may have to go back and redo some of those earlier tox studies. And then as you can draw the conclusions, as we move from phase one to phase two to phase three, if the impurity profile changes, we may need to go back and add arms or add an extension to some of the earlier studies in order to show that we're studying the exact same entity. The, the other uh, items that are begun at this point are development reports that are typically written by your contract manufacturing organization. These development reports outline the steps used um, in the optimization of your manufacturing process. And these reports are going to be critical when you go um, to submit your first IND and when you finally go to submit your new drug application. The FDA likes to have a nice um, story, if you will, as far as why you made the choices you made along your development path. And finally, um, with regards to phase one, we'll begin the stability studies of our clinical batches. Now, for, for any drug that's being registered with the FDA, we will do stability studies, and these stability studies are done under ICH conditions. And typical ICH conditions are kind of a room temperature study of the drug at 25 degrees C um, and 60% relative humidity, and ex some accelerated stability studies where we look at the drug under higher temperatures and, and higher humidity levels. We need to um, assess the stability of our drug over time in order to, in the end, estimate a shelf life for the drug. For the purposes of a clinical study, we need to commit to the FDA that we're going to um, put this drug on stability um, for at least the length of the time of the clinical study so that we know if anything uh, arises from degradation of the drug over time, we're able to closely monitor that from a safety perspective. So typically at the time of an investigational new drug application, we like to have at least one month of stability data on our clinical product. That's not absolutely a, a necessity, but it's a good standard practice. So that represents the end of the phase one development. Now we'll move on to the phase two development of your drug. Phase two is, is, is truly simply an extension of phase one development. Um, in, in this case, instead of using typically healthy volunteers, we'll use um, health volunteers that, that have the disease state of interest in order to start to get some information on the efficacy of our drugs in humans. So with regards to what we need to do with our API, there are simple step-ups in the level of GMP and quality control that will be involved here, but it really won't be all that different from phase one to phase two. So as we mentioned before, the synthesis of your API will need to be under good manufacturing practice control. The level of documentation will be important and we'll need to be able to trace the various steps in manufacturing process that we've outlined to, to make our drug. The manufacturing instructions for our drug will be made up in an approved batch record that is reviewed by you, the sponsor, and that's signed off on by um, the sponsor and then by the manufacturing organization that's, that's helping you to synthesize and manufacture your drug. Formal certificates of analysis of the drug will be issued at phase two for your, for your API. The certificate of analysis will include the results of the analytical testing 
that you've determined are important and able to determine the characteristics and the safety of your drug. So you will begin to develop a set of specifications for your active pharmaceutical ingredient. And initially, in phase one, your specifications will be fairly wide because you will not have a lot of historical data on the, 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 the purity of your drug or some of the other parameters. And as we start to synthesize and manufacture more batches of the drug, we'll get a greater understanding of um, the, the scope of control that we can have on impurities and other essential aspects of the drug in order to make a little bit tighter and a little bit well, more well-rounded understanding of specifications. At phase two, it's important that we continue to assess those changes as we mentioned before. So if we're going to be changing a site where our drug is manufactured, or if we're going to be changing the process, we want to pay close attention to those things and in, ensure, for one, that the impurity profile is remaining the same and anything else that may affect the quality of our drug. This is critical at this time because, as we mentioned before, we don't want to get too far down the path of development of our drug and discover that one of these changes in process, in location, or otherwise have had some sort of effect on the drug that will prevent us from drawing a linear relation between the drug that was used in early phases and the quality of the drug that were used in these later phases. So chemical equivalency of the drug substances is, is an important aspect that needs to be kept in mind um, as we go forward. Um, in addition to, to, the, uh, to some of these aspects for phase two, the other aspects that begin to change for phase two involve our analytical methodologies. So our analytical methods in phase one are fairly high level. They're not validated methods and we're just beginning to qualify those methods. As we move into phase two, we further develop our analytical methods from the perspective of uh, analytical qualification. And by that, I mean that the methods continue to, um, we, we continue to develop accuracy, precision, and linearity parameters for our analytical methods. This goes along to the path to fully validating the method, which must be done a little bit later in the drug development process. But as we tighten the controls for the manufacture of the drug throughout phase one, phase two, phase three, we're also going to fully flesh out our analytical methodologies and our control and understanding of those methodologies. So for the development activities, at this point, you should be fairly confident in what your phase three process is going to be. And part of that from a QBD aspect is having the assessment of your critical process parameters and knowing how they impact your drug substance quality. You will need to define your, refine your define, design space uh, to make sure that you're keeping your critical attributes within the uh, appropriate ranges. And you, you should have the start of your risk mitigation plan, uh, whether you can actively control the risks, whether you are going to accept the risks with your development, and, and what you will do to make sure that you're monitoring that and taking care of it appropriately. And now we've basically come to the end of phase two studies um, on our active pharmaceutical ingredient. And this is a good time to, again, think back to what our end game is going to be from a new drug development perspective. Um, at the end of phase two, this is another opportunity that we have to, to meet with the FDA. So there's something called um, an end of phase two meeting or a pre-NDA meeting, and this is a, an opportunity where we can take a look at the um, the development 
of our drug to this point in time and share some of that information with the FDA and give them an idea of what we plan to submit at the time of the new drug application. This is a very valuable meeting um, where we can get some feedback from the FDA on what we've done and what we plan to do so that we're poised for an approval um, by the time we're submitting a new drug application. So for phase three, we are not only preparing clinical trial material supplies as we were for phase one and phase two, we're preparing what we call registration stability batches. And as we move towards a new drug application, we need to have three batches made of our drug that we put on registration stability studies. And the registration stability studies have certain parameters as far as the size. Um, two of the batches need to be of a commercial size. One of the batch can be one-tenth of the size of your commercial. But these are the critical batches that get put on stability for our official registration stability for the new drug application. So in this case, these critical batches will have complete and full good manufacturing controls according to ICHQ7A. Again, as in phase one and two, the manufacturing instructions will um, be done in an approved batch record and in a for formal format that's approved by both the sponsor and by the manufacturing site. Again, the cleaning verification is critical to have at this point if you're using equipment that is not dedicated to only your uh, active or only your drug substance. You're going to want to carefully assess any changes at this time, any changes in manufacturing site or manufacturing process because we're getting extremely close to the end of, of our development and getting close to basically locking down what our presentation is going to be to the FDA for a new drug application. Continued development and activities are as follows. Uh, we will select our proposed final commercial manufacturing facilities. We're going to be finalizing the actual manufacturing process, the in-process controls that we will have, and the critical process parameters. We'll finalize our understanding of, of the physiochemical properties of our drug. We'll finalize our understanding of the impurity profile and, and really have an understanding of what the impurities or related substances are that appear alongside our API. We have to be able to characterize um, these impurities as well in order to determine if they're genotoxic type impurities or just a related substance that is inherent in the synthesis of our target API. We will have reference standards at this time that are completely and fully qualified for the drug substance and for many of the major degradation projects and related substances. We will also have reference standards that will be used in our analytical methodology for comparison purposes. At this time, we will develop a final specification for our registration for our drug product. So we will develop a range for its assay, for its purity, potentially its pH, and, and potentially any other critical aspects that are involved in um, the, the, the profile of our drug. The stability studies, as we mentioned, will continue, and these will actually be our registration stability batches at this time as we make the phase three supplies. At this time, not only will we have audited our suppliers and our contract manufacturers, we may begin to work with them on some mock inspections, some mock pre-approval inspections, or the inspections that they will expect when the FDA may come and review the site at the time of new drug application submission. Our ultimate goal is a marketed product in this case. And as we've mentioned all along, we're kind of reverse engineering our drug substance based on the quality target product profile 
that we mentioned before. We know early on in the process what our target profile will be, and all of the steps of development that we've been doing up until now have been to assure that we meet that quality target profile at the end of our development process. So at the time we are ready to submit this information to the FDA, we'll have a complete understanding of our API, and we'll provide this in one, or two, one of two different mechanisms to the Food and Drug Administration. One of the mechanisms is to provide it in the drug substance section of a new drug application. And the other is to provide it in a drug master file, which is a, called a type 2 drug master file that's specific for API. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of the regional differences that are um, involved in the content of CMC within the common technical documents, um, some differences between an FDA submission, if you will, and a European submission. But before we get to that, I want to mention um, some of the, the things that a drug master file um, allows advantages for our, our, our development process. So the drug master file is used for a couple of different reasons. And one of the reasons is a, a purely business reason, and one of the reasons is a confidentiality reason. From a confidentiality perspective, the information we put in a drug master file gives us clear ownership of the manufacturer of our API if we want to ensure that, that we own that synthetic uh, route information. It also gives us the flexibility to, at some point, license our API to others who may want to put it in a drug product under a different form, but we want to maintain the confidentiality of how we make our drug substance itself in the manufacturing processes involved. From a business perspective, this allows us to be the uh, responsible regulatory submission um, holder of the file and we can have multiple applications referencing our DMF. So again, uh, controlling the understanding of the manufacturing process and potentially licensing it to, to others um, for business purposes. One of the questions that we mentioned earlier were, are, can the same quality section be submitted to multiple regions? Meaning, can it be submitted to the FDA and can it be submitted to the European uh, authorities? The short answer is yes, but there are some distinct differences. The FDA requests the method validation section and executed batch records, whereas Europe does not. Europe requests an expert report for module two. So they're very similar but not exactly the same. We are going to um, basically just move through the next few slides in order uh, for time purposes, but these slides show where in a common technical document, we would put the information that we've, we've developed throughout our, our API manufacturing process and where that belongs in our submission to the FDA. So I'm just going to quickly move through these and not talk through them right now, but they will be there for reference later to show exactly where in a common technical document, where in an IND application, the information we prepared will end up living. would like to next touch quickly on some post-approval issues with regards to your API development. 
So after submission of your new drug application, there are, are, are basically different areas in which we can make changes to the manufacturing process and, or, or other aspects of the API development that we've submitted in a new drug application. These changes are characterized according to um, the extent of change involved, and they'll be categorized, accord categorized according to major changes, minor changes, or moderate changes. And that changes the level of detail which is needed to be supplied to the FDA and the amount of time that the FDA will have in reviewing the change and approving it so that we can implement that formally within our NDA and within our current um, development process. Those details are included here, and we can talk to some of the, the potential changes um, in the question and answer session if anyone has any questions about this. The last two aspects that we kind of we want to take a quick look at are API development for biological and botanical products. For biological products, the steps of development of your API are, are pretty similar, um, but each class of biological product is, is fairly unique. One of the major differences between the development of a small molecule and a biological has to do with the measurement of its activity or assay. Whereas with a small molecule, you're going to be measuring basically how much material is present. With a biological uh, active compound, you're going to be probably measuring some sort of activity uh, uh, of, of efficacy compared to, to quantity. And there are several different um, guidance documents that walk us through the various different types of biological products um, that can be considered APIs that we may pursue as potential new drugs. The other category we want to quickly look at are botanical products. Now, botanical products are drug products that are intended for the diagnosis and cure and prevention of disease in humans that are derived from vegetables, plant materials, and so forth. There's a guidance from 2004 that speaks to the development process for these types of, of APIs. There's a couple of different sourcing issues that we wanted to make you aware of if you're thinking of developing a botanical product. The, uh the control of pesticides is very important. Uh, so what pesticides you allow your farms to use needs to be monitored, controlled, and monitored throughout the manufacturing process. Another factor that is often overlooked is seasonal variation uh, as far as supply chain. So natural events that may affect the, uh, the in ingredients as they're being processed droughts, blizzards, things like that that aren't, uh, aren't necessarily as much of a factor in traditional small molecule development. The other important aspect to think of when you're developing a botanical API is the ability to either use the natural extracted compound itself, an extract from a plant. You could make a semi-synthetic route where you start with something natural and make a synthetic modification or you can make a fully synthetic API based upon a known um, plant or, or natural um, compound structure. And there's different scenarios based upon where you land with regards to going from natural to synthetic. And uh, those are important considerations to make. So we've basically walked you through the entire process from the discovery of your compound, of your API, through the early phase studies uh, where you're uh, studying your compound in animals, through study in humans, and through hopefully to new drug application and approval of the drug in order to commercialize it. Um, I'm going to end the, this part of the discussion now so we can have a little bit of uh, time for the question and answer session. I thank you for your time on this and, and your attention, and I, I look forward to answering any questions that may be out there for us. Uh, well, thank, thanks, Michael and Brian, for that great presentation. Um, let's start uh, with our question and answer 
portion of the webinar. And again, if you have any questions, just type them in the Ask a Question box and we'll get to as many as we can. So let's um, take a look at our first question here. And uh, the question is, do registration batches have to be phase three validated or can they be phase two CGMP? So the answer to that is that your, your batches throughout your process need to follow CGMP requirements. You, throughout your process, are gaining a better understanding of your process variables. And your validation does not need to occur until prior to commercial and highly recommended prior to the drug product validation. So the phase three validation uh, doesn't really have to happen for phase three material. It needs to happen during phase three and prior to commercialization. Yeah, I think an, an important distinction to make here is that the analytical methods need to be validated as, as we move through phase three. The actual manufacturing process itself as Brian said, does not need to be validated until you're going commercial. So you do not have to have a validated manufacturing process, and we didn't really speak to that right today at the time of your new drug application. But the methods themselves should be validated for your phase three supplies. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, let's go on to our next question, which is what are process qualifications qualification requirements for a phase one API? Okay, so I, if I, I hope I'm capturing the essence of this question correctly, but it, the, the process itself, the synthetic process and the manufacturing process for a phase one API, the only requirements are that it is a, a documented synthetic process, a documented manufacturing process, as we mentioned in the talk, this could even be done in controlled laboratory notebooks, but from everything that we typically see here at Cardinal, um, we see it done in a master batch record. Um, the, the process itself does not need to have any sort of validation or qualification, if you will. It just has to be well documented so that you know the quality of each of the materials that we're going into making the drug substance. You have to know the quality of any of the solvents that were being used and, and any of the other um, items that were used in making the drug substance will be documented in that batch record so we can trace um, back any potential impurities or anything else that may have happened to that drug um, while you were making your phase one supply. Um, let's move on to our next question, which is, uh, do API raw material manufacturers have to be CGMP compliant and FDA approved or, um, I guess, approved by any other or other regulatory agencies? Um, it, it, the, part of this depends on the phase of drug development that you're in. But the raw, ma raw material manufacturers themselves do not necessarily have to be GMP compliant. Um, the, the GMP compliance comes in the, um, in, the, in the drug development process on your end as the sponsor. So the raw material manufacturers may never be actually inspected um, by the FDA, but we do have to qualify them from our perspective to ensure that they're able to provide consistent uh, raw materials that meet a certain specification that we're looking for and that we're able to incorporate those into our manufacturing or synthetic process and, and get a consistent end product. So. It's a good question because it's kind of a gray area, but the, the black and white answer is that they, they don't have to be absolutely FDA approved. And FDA approval is something I'd like to 
speak to just very briefly. A lot of times you will hear a contract manufacturing organization or, or an API supplier itself say they're FDA approved. Well, for the purposes of a new drug, that, there's no such thing. They may have been inspected by the FDA, they may have passed the inspection with flying colors, but that just means they were approved at that point in time for whatever particular product they were, were going for, which is actually, you know, which is a great sign, but it doesn't mean they have any sort of long-term approval and that all of the, the, the next steps of products that they make are, are guaranteed to be FDA approved. So we need to do our due diligence with any um, raw material manufacturers or contract research organiz contract manufacturing organizations to ensure that yes, they've been approved, they've been inspected by the FDA once, but are they going to pass an inspection based on the type of work we're doing with them right now? And that's an important distinction to make. Okay, great, thank you for that. Uh, let's move on to our next question, which is. Uh, for development reports, are there any guidances, templates, or expectations? So there, there are guidances and recommendations, but a development report is really looked at as an internal document and not necessarily shared with the FDA. The critical parts of your development report will all be supplied in the CTD documents and the uh, the uh, 32S or sections of your submission. So as you're develop writing your development report, you should uh, make sure that you keep that in mind, that that is really what your end product is that's being submitted to the FDA. Okay. Uh, Let's move on to the next question, which is, uh, should analytical methods be validated b before testing APIs? I can take that one. And the answer is not necessarily. And as we said before, this is a, an iterative process. So at phase one, you definitely do not need to have validated analytical methods. As you go into phase two, you need to have a little bit more control or a little bit better understanding of those methods. And we typically call that a qualification of the methods where maybe just accuracy, precision, and linearity are, are pursued and understood. As we move to phase three studies and then right before we submit a, a new drug application, the analytical methods absolutely have to be validated in order to prove that they uh, our stability indicating and that, that we can um, actually see any impurities or any other um, sort of thing that may occur within the API over time. Great. Uh, let's move on to another question. Um, this one is, uh, can you expand um, some on the topic of uh, registration? Okay, I'm taking a look at the question. So uh, the particular question is talking about the registration stability batches and the size of the stability batches, I believe, registration versus commercial scale. So registration batches, um, th there must be three of them that we know, and two of the three must be at commercial scale. Now, commercial scale is going to be determined by the the need for this drug, first of all, and it will be determined by the type of equipment that you're manufacturing on and its size. Um, and so there's going to be a little bit of discussion with the FDA on defining what your commercial scale is. And there's lots of different things that go into that, along with potential market share and so forth, depending on what type of drug you're making. But that third batch only needs to be one-tenth commercial size. Um, but it needs to be done and, and, and manufactured in a manner that is completely representative of what you're going to do from a commercial perspective. Um, so same process, same solvents, same synthetic route, and so forth. Um, but the, the registration stability batches are kind of a, a kind of a 
an end goal to any drug development process, which we're always working towards making those three batches and that we know that those are going to be the batches that the FDA most closely scrutinizes the stability information in order to determine a shelf life for our drug and if the drug itself is is stable over time. Um, and, and so that's, it's a very critical part of the API development program in getting to that point of uh, registration batch. Thank you. Um, well, unfortunately, uh, that's all the time we have for our Q&A session. Uh, any questions that were not um, able to be answered here live will be answered by our presenters via email. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, Mr. Michael Day and Mr. Brian Cudney for sharing their knowledge with us and also offer a special thank you to Cardinal Health for sponsoring today's event. Uh, please keep a lookout for an email containing a link to view this webinar on demand. Thank you from all of us today.